how to vote. You're ready, set, and raring to participate in the electoral process. Your enthusiasm is great, but if you want to make your vote count, you'll need to know where to go and what to do. You will need registration confirmation, information about your local polling place, a calendar, a government-issued ID or suitable alternative, a portable source of entertainment, and an opinion. Optional, a love of democracy. Step one, triple check your information. Put election day on your calendar and use a site like canivote.org to confirm that you're actually registered. Then, check your state's website to make sure you know where your proper polling place is, how to get there, and its hours. Step two, let your boss or professor know if you plan to vote before or during work or school hours. Since the voting process can take some time, giving a heads up to the powers that be can save you a lot of grief later on. Step three, bring documentation that will establish your right to vote. Each state's regulations differ, so look up your local rules on vote411.org. Some places require you to present a government-issued ID, like a driver's license or passport, while others send you a voter ID card after you register. Some places will let you use other documentation, like a utility bill, bank statement, or paycheck as well. Step four, a lot of people want to make their voice heard, so you sometimes may need to wait for your turn at the voting booth. Bring along something to keep you entertained while you wait. Polling lines usually peak early in the morning and late at night. If you'd like to avoid the wait, cast your ballot during off hours. Step five, if you're worried about how exactly you'll be casting your ballot, visit vote411.org to familiarize yourself with the methods available in your area. Your options might include an optical scan ballot, a mechanical lever machine, or a paper or electronic ballot. Consult the army of voting day volunteers at the polling location if you have any questions. They'll be happy to help you. Step six, arrive at your polling location, wait your turn, enter the booth, and cast your ballot. Democracy feels good, doesn't it? Did you know, in the 2000 presidential election, only 55% of voting age Americans cast a ballot. Hi, this is attorney Kevin Hazlett, and the question is, what is the jury's role in a criminal case? We've all seen movies and read books and watched TV, and we understand that a jury decides the fate of the accused, meaning that the jury sits in judgment and determines whether or not that person is guilty or not guilty. But where does the right to a jury come from? The Sixth Amendment of the United States guarantees each and every one of us the right to a jury trial in certain situations by an impartial jury. What that means is that during the jury selection process, the judge and the lawyers involved in the case will ferret out during the jury selection process called voir dire, fair and impartial jurors. In most states or jurisdictions, a jury, a criminal jury, consists of 12 folks. That means if you are accused of a crime, in order to be convicted, 12 jurors, all 12 jurors must unanimously, all together, agree on one verdict that you are guilty beyond and to the exclusion of any and all reasonable doubt. If they cannot agree, then that jury is declared hung, meaning they can't make a decision, and generally you are tried again. Now, most states and jurisdictions have a set number of times for which you can be retried if there is a hung jury. Hung jury again, meaning that they can't decide on a verdict. Generally, if there is a doubt, the judge will instruct the jury. If they have a reasonable doubt, they must find the defendant not guilty. 
So in a jury trial, in jurisdictions, we must have 12 unanimous folks agree to a verdict of guilty or not guilty. But in some jurisdictions on petty offenses, misdemeanor offenses, or non-life felonies, some states will allow six jurors. But in all criminal cases, the jurors and the verdict must be unanimous. Carlson, Meisner, Hart, and Hazlett, protecting your rights since 1971. Good morning, and welcome to Norfolk Circuit Court. I'm George Schaefer, Clerk of the Court. I'd like to take a few minutes to thank you for coming and to give you an idea of what you can expect during jury service. If you have any questions while you're in this jury assembly area, please see one of the deputy clerks in the office at the rear of this room. Now, let me take you inside one of our courtrooms. Before the trial begins, a group of potential jurors will be sitting in these benches and questioned. When answering any question, you should stand, state your name, and speak loud enough for the judge to hear you. Please remember, in the interest of providing a fair trial, it is extremely important for you to acknowledge if you know any of the parties in the case, or if you have any other conflict that would keep you from being fair. At this stage, some of you may be excused. Please know you have already performed a valuable service just by being present and participating in the selection process. If you are selected to sit on a jury, before exiting the courtroom, you will be given a badge. You need to wear this at all times while on court premises. This lets everyone in the court know that you are an active juror. Now let's take a look at who is in the courtroom during a trial and where they sit. The judge presides over every trial from their bench. The judge will conduct the case, decide what evidence is allowed, instruct the jury about the law, and hear and decide legal arguments made by attorneys. The clerk maintains the court file and swears in the jury and witnesses and sits in front of the judge in criminal cases. The attorneys occupy the front tables to the left and to the right. The bailiff is in the courtroom to keep order maintain security, and to help the judge or jury as needed, sits to one side. The court reporter, who keeps the official record by recording every word spoken during the trial, will usually sit to one side in a chair. Witnesses who are testifying will testify from the witness box. And last, you, the jury. You will be sitting here in the jury box. When the trial is completed and your verdict is announced, the judge will then dismiss you and the other jury members, and you will be free to leave and discuss the case with anyone. The constitutional right to jury trial is the cornerstone of our legal system. A trial by jury allows people involved in a criminal matter or civil dispute the benefit of the judgment of the entire community. Your voice matters in the Virginia justice system. We know you will take the responsibility seriously. Please note you are entitled to compensation for your service, so see the deputy clerk before leaving. On behalf of the entire court, thank you. Welcome. I'm Sean Kajayan. I've developed a jury selection system called the Jury Selection Pro. Exploring jurors' prejudices is very important. When you ask a juror how they feel about the burden of proof and they say, well, I don't know if it's entirely fair. I don't think it's fair to, to put the burden of proof on the government. So you see, you have to explore that further. You ask the juror next to him, sir, you heard what Juror uh, Smith had to say. How do you feel about that? 
and then this way you bring out their prejudices. When Juror Smith answers you in the way that he did, you ask him why. You don't try to fix that opinion or try to educate him on the law. What you do is you ask the next juror how they feel. You want to hear from these jurors their prejudices, their predispositions, and after they answer you, you thank them. See, it's important to be friendly and to be honest. For example, you're letting them know that you're appreciating their honest answers because this is what you want to hear during jury selection because you can't change their opinions and so it's important to hear their predispositions before you accidentally impanel them onto a jury. A potential juror is not going to freely admit to you his or her affinity towards law enforcement and so you have to develop not only those challenges and those bases but also non-traditional challenges. A juror's inability to speak English well, their inability to communicate, talk uh, in the English language is important because if they can't communicate properly during jury selection and can't easily answer the judge's questions, how could we expect these jurors to understand these complicated jury instructions? Look at the jurors. While you're asking a juror a question, if another juror reacts a different way, either speak to that juror at that time or keep that in mind and discuss it with the judge and challenge that other juror that had those facial reactions or for example being inattentive or falling asleep or shrugging their shoulders while answering in a particular way that is inconsistent with their body language you have to embrace these these moments and use them to challenge those jurors you only have a certain amount of preemptory challenges and so don't be afraid to challenge for cause as many jurors as possible keep in mind jurors have not come necessarily willingly to jury selection they've been summoned as jurors in a particular case they may not like you they may not know you yet and they certainly don't know your client and so with that you have to understand they expect lawyers to be competent effective focused so with that understand that the jurors are looking at you and your client at all times so when the judge asks you to come to sidebar you have to quickly don't waste time don't lollygag quickly go to sidebar and regardless of what happens at sidebar you have to act and behave like you won also understand the judge's role He's more likely not inclined to pick the most fair jury, but more likely inclined to pick 12 jurors and just move this case along. And so you have to understand, you have to make a record. Make a record for your cause challenges, and that record includes any facial reactions potential jurors had, or anything that would possibly relate to cause uh, bases for challenges, including prejudices, biases, inability to speak English, mental infirmity, or anything else you can think of. The jury selection pro allows you to note the important responses of jurors, of course, their name, their occupation, and so forth, but also allows you to more easily, as soon as the juror is excused for cause or preemptories or whatever it may be, you can easily replace the juror with the other cards that you've already filled out. And so you can see quite easily that this process has become very effective and focused. There are no scribbles on a yellow pad that you can't read or stickies that make no sense because you are stressed for time. No, this jury selection pro and its cards and its grid allows you to easily remove jurors, replace them with cards that have already filled out. You've already formed opinions about these jurors because you filled, them out, filled out the cards appropriately. And so when you go to sidebar, you take your grid with you, and you are ready to go. You're ready to challenge 20, 30, 40 jurors, however many it takes for you to win your case. Remember, when they attacked Africa, they did not attack Africa physically. They did not attack Africa educationally. They attacked Africa spiritually. 
Jomo Kenyatta said when the European first came to Africa, the Africans had the land and the white man had the Bible. White man told him to close his eyes, get on his knees and pray. Jomo said when the black man opened his eyes, the white man had the land and the black man had the Bible. We have bought into a story that we told them. They have twisted it. They got it twisted. We have not bought that story back. Bukman, Haitian Revolution, the original revolutionary, because he was turned in the night of the revolution. That's when Toussaint Louverture took over. The book irritated Jimmy. We need to rename him Bukman. Bukman was called Bukman from Jamaica because he couldn't be handled in Jamaica. He was sold in Haiti. He started a rebellion amongst the African people. And they knew him as Bukman because they always read. He was very intelligent. He always taught the people who they were and what they were. The night before the revolution, Bukman looked at his brothers and sisters in the field. And he said, you want to win? Cast aside your white god. Embrace your African spirit. You are free. He didn't say you will be free. He didn't say you can be free. He didn't say you could be free. He said, cast aside your white god. You are free. There was a brother who was a former U.S. Marshal, and he was speaking about the war on drugs. Well, I want you to pay attention to what he is saying. It's going to be quite interesting. Let me go ahead and roll the clip. Working for a number five precinct. They throw me their keys, and I would have to get in their cars, and like they park up the block. I'd have to either back up or take it around the block. Either a kid sitting in a police car. Oh, man, my chest just grew about 10 inches, man, you know, because I get in the car and I'm riding. And I started thinking this is what I want to do. I became supervisor of Group 42 for the Drug Enforcement Administration. They cross-designated me. I had to get sworn in as a special agent for DEA. So now I'm doing, I'm doing double dual tasks. I'm a U.S. Marshal and I'm a special agent for DEA. That's when I picked up the name Batman. I'm talking about Gotham City, man. We were rolling, man. We were jumping on guys in the middle of the night, all of that swooping down on folks all across the country. Using these sort of tactical operations that we went out on that you would use in Vietnam or using some type of war-torn zone. And all of the stuff that we were doing, just calling it the war on drugs. And it wasn't very many black guys in my position. So when I would go into the war room where we were setting up all of our drug and gun addiction task forces, determining what cities where we were going to hit, I would notice that most of the time was always appeared to be urban areas. <clears throat> That's when I asked the question, well, don't they sell, sell drugs out Potomac and Springfield and, and places like that? Or well, maybe y'all think they don't. The statistics show they use more drugs out in those areas than anywhere. The special agent in charge, he says, you know, we go out there and start messing with those folks. They know judges, they know lawyers, they know politicians. You start locking their kids up, somebody's going to jerk our chain. He said, they're going to call us on it, and before you know it, they're going to shut us down, and there goes your overtime. What I begin to see is that the drug war is totally about race. If we was locking up everybody, white and black, for doing the same drugs, they would have done the same thing they did with prohibition. They would have outlawed it. They would have said, let's stop this craziness because you're not putting my son in jail. My daughter's not going to jail. If it was an equal enforcement opportunity operation, we wouldn't be sitting here anyway. It's all about fairness, man, and understanding how would I want to be treated. Whether I'm on that one end or the other end, how would I want to be treated if everything was done equally? You hear what this man has said. This man was not no low-ranking official. He was a supervisor in the U.S. Marshals. They had a name for themselves. But yet when he brought it up, they say, wait a minute. Why are we only going to black neighborhoods, Latino neighborhoods, people of color? But well, we are going to the white neighborhoods when statistics show there are more drug use in the white neighborhoods. What do they say to him? Oh, no, we ain't doing that because uh, they got money for lawyers. They know judges. They know district attorneys. You know, we do that and start pressing them like that, man, we'll lose our jobs. So you mean to tell me law enforcement, U.S. Marshals are afraid to go put this war on drugs in the white communities because they're connected? But it's okay in the black, Latino, any people of color community because we don't have the lawyers, the judges in our pockets. We don't have connections. Do you see how this brother is revealing that they want to lock people of color up? They're not going to push these laws on people in the white neighborhoods. And I'm not blaming the people in the white neighborhoods why they won't do it. I'm just saying that you see how racist law enforcement is. 
This is why they don't want people like this brother getting in those positions. All the people of color. Because when they come back and bring the stories from the horse's mouth and say, wait a minute. It is a systematic racism in law enforcement toward people of color versus white people. They, no, they, don't, they can't have that. Because now you're whistleblowing. You're telling all the business. And this, I'm glad this brother put out this video and said that. And we've been knowing that. This is not nothing, you know, new at all to people of color. How is it that blacks and Latinos are the ones that got the highest incarceration rates? Think about it. We Both of our groups do. But yet, we don't even, if you combine our numbers together, don't even match the numbers of white people in America. Now, we're stating facts. We got a man who was a former U.S. Marshal saying this sort of thing. And personally, I don't think it's right. If you got a law, everybody needs to buy by the law. So that means what? In the black community, if we just all of a sudden explode with money, we get connections because we got money, they're going to leave us alone too. We can do all this illicit drug use too. Like, come on. Like they say about drugs, black people ain't got no planes. They don't have no boats. They don't have none of that to bring it in this country. It's brought into our neighborhoods. The guns are brought into our neighborhoods. But yet, we the one is getting incarcerated like we shipping it in. I don't get that. And that don't make a bit of sense. But now we see, not only by the numbers, that blacks are more incarcerated and Latinos than maybe white people are, now you got a former U.S. Marshal saying the basic same thing, that the people of color neighborhood is targeted because they are free because the white neighborhoods are connected but due to money. That's sad. That is sad. And this further lets you know how racism doesn't go away. How racism is in every facet of America. I was reading a comment from a person from another country that say America has a mental sickness. And it's the truth. We do have a mental sickness. It is something wrong with your mindset to look at a person's color and say they're not worth anything because of a color. What would happen when for instance, one color may not be here anymore. What, what would happen then? Or what if more people were more brown in this nation than the other way around? What would happen then? I'm just saying, because that's kind of heading that way. What, I mean, I, if you think about it, it's more brown people all over the world than you may say white people. But this is the thing. We all just want to live in peace. We all want to live fair. That's it. That's how we want. We want just to equal rights, equal treatment. But yet, we don't get that. And you have a U.S. farmer, U.S. marshal sitting here telling you, no, you don't get treated equally. Because the way we go after you, we go after you. We don't go after them. We know they got more drugs in their neighborhood. This is what the brother's saying. We know it. By the numbers, we know it. Statistics, we know it. But we're going to leave them alone because they connected. Because they got money and bother the poor people of color because we can lock them up. They're not going to defend against that and get them in the prison system to have them as slaves for working for corporations, working for 50 to maybe 90 cents a day. I see how it all coming together, how this, how this racism is just coming together for the bigger agenda, not just so much I can't stand you because you want color, no, it's an agenda to get people of color in prison so you can do all this work for corporations and they don't have to actually hire American citizens to do jobs even for a minimum wage. They either gonna get it from the Chinese cheap or they're going to get it from the uh, inmate cheap. But they're going to get it cheap. Why are they making all the money? Everything's connected to corporate America. Everything. The judicial system is, co is connected to corporate America. They for screwing everybody. The only reason they don't screw white people, they screw them, but they don't screw them in the way they screw us because we don't have the money. Now, if we had the money, then they would have to figure out what other group they can screw next. But the reason why white people get covered is because they got more money, and that's due to them having more jobs. And we all know the situation with the jobs is that if you're black, you may not get hired as fast if you say you're white, like the sister did the test, that had the same qualifications, said she was a white lady, got more uh, job offers versus saying she's a black woman. I mean, and this has happened, and we've all been knowing this, or just people of color in a sense. Now, these are, you know, the facts I'm presenting. This is not, I am not no nationalist. I am not part of any organization. I pay attention to the truth and facts. And this is the facts. Black people, people of color in America, get the bad end of the stick. And then if we say something about it, we got the problem.
something wrong with us for speaking up about it. But I'm sorry, until you all start saying, wait a minute, we all need to be treated equal. This is, we, who, if a person don't have money, why are you trying to systematically ruin them? Why are you trying to destroy their homes and their families? But you don't do it to the other community because they have money or you fear they may be connected. And not all white people got money like that anyway. I know white people. White people struggling like everybody else. Not every white person pockets so deep. And not every white person got connections to judges and lawyers like that. They struggling too. But yet, it's a fear. It's a myth. All white people got money. So I'm going to leave them alone. What y'all think about what the brother had to say? Anyway, hit me up in the comments. In future commentary, subscribe to the YouTube channel. The racial composition of the prison population in the United States is very different from the population at large. If people are worried about inequality in America today, I think this deserves more attention in the discussion. Racial inequality in the criminal justice system gets ignored because it doesn't affect most people. In 2010, over 1.6 million people were in state and federal prisons within the United States. So 497 out of every 100,000 Americans were in jail about half of 1%. Less than 1%. That doesn't seem very large, but when you separate that population by race, you recognize that the personal effects of the criminal justice system are very unequally shared throughout our society. Whites make up 64% of the total population, but only 31% of the incarcerated population. Blacks represent 14% of society, but 36% of the prison population. Hispanics are 16% of America, but 24% of the American prison population. Less than one in a hundred Americans are currently in jail, but for some races, genders, and age groups, that ratio is a lot larger. For example, if you're young, black, and male, it's closer to about one in four. That means you'd have a higher probability of going to jail than of getting married or going to college. These results are unequal and problematic as poor black communities lack so many of their members. But what can be done? The causes of this trend are undoubtedly complicated and multi-causal. But there is reason to suggest that part of the blame is our criminal justice system itself. In the ways police officers enforce laws, in the ways that laws are written and prosecuted, and more. In many cases, it is not overt racism by individual actors. Many police officers, prosecutors, and judges are undoubtedly trying to be fair and trying to do the right thing. But economics can explain how unequal enforcement of the criminal law happens anyway. This is because the political and bureaucratic structure of the criminal justice system creates perverse incentives. The formal laws surrounding drug prohibition, for example, are written as if to be colorblind. But people with different levels of wealth face different costs and benefits to participating in the drug trade. Different groups consume different drugs at different rates, and lastly, those groups are politically represented in very different quantities. Thus, they are arrested and incarcerated at very different rates. How could minority groups hope to use the political process to fix inequality when they are systematically over-incarcerated and disenfranchised? Despite noble intentions, Politics often does not affect the basic incentives of costs and benefits faced by political or citizen actors. We might need a new approach to social change if we are going to address these problems. We definitely need more study into the causes of inequality, and we should admit that radical changes might be both necessary and preferable to the status quo. Meet the American prison system. They call me the beast. He's gotten bigger and bigger, gobbling resources that could be going to communities. Mm, tasty community. The United States is paying to have 2.3 million people behind bars. 
That's more than China, more than Iran, more than any country on Earth. Over half the prison population is in for non-violent offenses. That'll cost you. Back in the 80s, the beast was slimmer. But now, we're paying $228 billion a year for the system. What could we do with even half that? How many teachers could we hire? How many rehabilitation and prevention programs could we fund so crimes don't happen in the first place? Ow. Want to stop the beast from destroying your community? Then stop feeding me. <laughs> Cut prison spending now. Go beyond bars. It began with a sweeping drug raid in a small Texas town. I'm glad that we got most of the drug dealers off the street. But soon, there were troubling questions. Absolutely no backup, no wire, no recording, no surveillance, no photograph, no nothing. A local story that took on national significance. You began to wonder how many of these cases are really tainted. And a team of dedicated investigators struggled to find the truth. We did what the district attorney should have done before he prosecuted one damn case. We went and investigated what happened. This is a story about the collapse of the criminal justice system in a place called Tulia, Texas. Were they really guilty or simply railroaded in Texas? Imagine this. You are asleep in your bed in the early morning hours. Suddenly, police in flak jackets and hoods come in and arrest you. They charge you with a crime you didn't commit. The only evidence against you is the word of one man, but the jury convicts you anyway. Not here, not in America, well, you're wrong. Tonight, come on a journey with us to a small town you've probably never heard of, but should have. A place called Tulia, Texas. On July 23, 1999, the early morning quiet in Tulia, Texas was shattered as lawmen from around the Texas Panhandle descended on what had always seemed to be the law-abiding seat of rural Swisher County. In a lightning drug raid, police officers and sheriff's deputies surrounded houses, swooped around corners, and made mass arrests in a stunning display of force. For some, the images of lawmen in body armor and even hoods, escorting black suspects to jail, evoked memories of a different era. It seemed like a made-for-television event as a ragtag parade of reputed dealers and drug kingpins walked the perp walk. What people saw on the news that night was maybe a dozen people being uh, hauled across the courthouse lawn. Uh, many of them were half-dressed, you know, their hair uncombed, they were cuffed. The sweep appeared to be a staggering success. And with more than 30 people arrested that day, the local jail even ran out of room. 
the overflow was sent to neighboring counties and towns as far away as Amarillo. That day, the good citizens of Tulia, Texas, seemed to breathe a sigh of relief. We hate that in this community that there were 46 people that were selling drugs, but, uh, uh, and sub probably substantially more than that selling drugs in the community. Most of the people said, uh, boy, I'm glad that we got most of the drug dealers or drug sellers off the street. Maybe they won't infiltrate into our school and sell it to our kids. It wouldn't make the network news that day or for many days to come. It amounted to about 10 percent of the entire black population in Tulia. Extraordinary event. Should have um, been national headlines uh, in the beginning, whether the people were, were guilty or not. There should, just the idea that this raid had occurred uh, should have been big news. Tulia, Texas, a farm town of 5,000, where most people simply struggle to survive. It hardly seemed a hotbed of drug activity, and there certainly were no signs of the fast money that comes with the illegal drug trade. Tulia is definitely not what it used to be, and, and the reason is the same reason uh, for any small town that relies on agriculture. No matter how hard they work, they just can't make the same kind of living that their parents made in agriculture. While drugs were not an obvious part of the Tulia landscape, religion was and is with more than 20 churches serving its small population. I was 31 years old. Cowboy preachers minister at Wednesday night suppers, and those looking for a stiff drink, or even a beer, better go elsewhere. Tulia's a dry town. We're certainly rural, and we're certainly not uh, as sophisticated as some, and we're thankful for that. I like Tulia. It's a quiet town. You don't have to worry about the drive-by and people breaking in your house and stuff like that. So, I don't want to live anywhere else. Apparently, Sheriff Larry Stewart, Tulia's top cop, saw another side of his town. In the mid-1990s, he became convinced that trouble was lurking in the shadows of Tulia's back streets. The scourge of illegal drugs. People that live in communities that don't think they have a drug problem in the community probably have their head stuck in the sand. Uh, and Tulia is no different. Everybody in town pretty well knows that there's certain hangouts where there's drugs going on. A small block of public housing occupied largely by black families had frequently been described by locals as a center of drug activity. An area next to a convenience store was another. So in late 1997, Sheriff Stewart took his first step to rid Tulia of its drug problem. He began working with the Regional Panhandle Narcotics Task Force to set up an undercover drug sting. An undercover agent, whose face was unknown in Tulia, was assigned to man the operation, alone. I was a deep undercover. Nobody knew where I was or who I was, not even the police. Agent Tom Coleman was young, enthusiastic, and certainly seemed eager to make a name for himself. Coleman wanted his first undercover assignment to be his big break, and he took to it with almost religious zeal. If you're going to be a cop and identify people, you're going to have to know what you're doing because you're going to put them in jail for a long time for selling narcotics. He assumed the alias of T.J. Dawson and basically went to work in Tulia, tried to live down there, and tried to work his way into the drug culture. Mr. Coleman was told when he came into the county to go wherever his investigation led him, no one was off limits. Coleman began by finding work in a busy place, Tulia Sale Barn, where cattle are auctioned weekly. That's where he met Elijah Kelly. I was working at the sale barn, and he come out there and he applied for a job to help on Mondays, and that's how I met him. Uh, Casey's cattle right up here down the road. Coleman befriended Kelly a semi-retired laborer and longtime Tulia resident. Hungry for information, the agent plied Kelly, a former alcoholic, with liquor. And he started asking me questions about did I know why I could get some cocaine at. So there was a few guys that I knew that did do it. And so that's how we got hooked up together. According to Coleman, Kelly then became his tour guide to the seamy underside of Tulia. 
Coleman remained deep undercover, keeping his true identity a secret. He told Kelly he was buying drugs for girlfriends. Day and night, they cruised around town, searching for anyone who would sell them drugs. The results of Coleman's investigation appeared to be nothing short of remarkable. They left Coleman out in the field for 18 months, during which time he claimed to have made over 150 different cocaine buys and a few marijuana buys from 46 different defendants, which in a town of 5,000 people is an incredibly impressive number. Two or three times a week, he would make the 50-mile trip to Amarillo to test and then log in the drug evidence, evidence that would prove to be critical at trial. Finally, by the summer of 1999, Sheriff Stewart and DA Terry McEachern had seen enough. Thanks to Coleman, there was now enough evidence to pursue multiple convictions. The grand jury wholeheartedly agreed. They indicted 46 people on 132 separate charges of selling drugs. The prosecution's first target was Joe Moore, and his case looked like a slam dunk. Moore had a prior drug conviction and for years had run an illegal nightclub outside of town. With Coleman's testimony and evidence, a jury convicted Moore with blinding speed. The sentence for selling three and a half grams of cocaine, 90 years, a virtual life sentence. Other guilty verdicts quickly followed. Sentences ranged from 20 to 341 years. The clear message, if you're caught dealing drugs in Tulia, you're going to jail for a long time. <laughs> Defense attorneys could do little else but try to cut deals for their clients. I concluded that I, I could not win them and that the exposure to my clients was, was huge. We were watching verdicts come back that were just huge. The trials and convictions continued into the year 2000. And Tom Coleman in his first undercover investigation had become a superstar. Already a local hero in Tulia, Coleman was honored as Texas Lawman of the Year. But soon, questions about his investigation would begin to surface from the most unlikely source. On July 23, 1999, the small Texas town of Tulia was shaken to its core. After an 18-month-long undercover investigation, more than 40 people had been indicted for selling drugs. Many in town were stunned by the scale of the roundup. But there was at least one person in Tulia who was skeptical of the arrests. Gary Gardner, a retired farmer and crop duster, is an unlikely investigator. But his gut instinct was that at least some of the defendants simply weren't smart enough to be drug dealers. A couple of them in particular don't have the intelligence basically to keep themselves out of the out of the weather. Gardner has always lived in and around Tulia. And he's always asked a lot of questions. Those who like him call him earthy. Those who don't call him a troublemaker. Me and my wife, we started investigating. Ma and Paul Kettley. They got their little tape recorder and their pad, and we started attending trials and talking to people. What he was hearing just didn't add up. Gardner wanted to know how a town that couldn't even keep a Dairy Queen in business could support 46 drug dealers. If each one of the 46 drug dealers has only one customer, you'd think, well, you know, somebody would get, be caught in possession. But what's unique in tell you, nobody ever, ever got caught in possession. We were extremely heavy on drug dealers, but extremely light on users. Gardner also couldn't understand the allegation that Joe Moore was a drug kingpin. Moore, a leader in the black community, could hardly be described as living the high life. Drug dealer, Joe Moore, the kingpin of the two drug dealers. Santa Claus, the mayor of Blacktown, that's who lived here, Joe Moore. He fed hogs for a living. This is pretty well the typical two-year drug dealer house. The stucco's falling off the walls. Go around the back side, about half the windows is knocked out. The shingles is blown off of it. And what about Leroy Barrow, 
He was accused of selling Tom Coleman almost two grams of powder cocaine, worth about $150. But Barrow spends his days collecting cans. That's what I do for a living, pick up cans and, uh, and, uh, and do all jobs. Wherever I can get my hands on them, do a little work, try to make it. I don't even have electricity on this place here, but I'm happy. I'm talking about a guy that picks up cans for a living, and he's supposed to walk around with $200 eight ball in his pocket. Didn't happen. But Gardner was dismissed as a crank, and Barrow, after spending nearly a year in jail, decided it was too risky to face a judge and a jury. He pled guilty to a lesser charge to avoid a longer sentence. I was just telling these people about you. But Gardner wouldn't give up. The first real investigation I did was two or three of the black ladies had attempted to get a copy of the indictments for everyone that was indicted and the local district clerk refused to give them to her and they asked me I says well they gotta give them to you you just ask for them they're open records and I'll be darned they wouldn't give them to me either and that kind of triggered me as to you know what in the hell are we hiding if we won't let people have the public records it took about three months actually before I got them Believe it or not, Gardner was the first person to look at all the evidence from all the cases together. And when he did, a clear pattern emerged that few people had noticed. Coleman had reported buying the same drug, white powder cocaine, in almost every case. To Gardner, that just didn't make sense. Crack is the predominant drug in the black community of Tuya. The 132 indictments that I originally acquired well, where it finally dawned on me that every case was for white cocaine and it was always for what he called an eight ball. As the trials continued at a relentless pace, Gardner's voice seemed to be the only one raising questions about Tom Coleman's investigation. Tom Coleman's investigation. When New York Times columnist Bob Herbert heard about Tulia, what he found shocked him. The investigation was a disaster. I mean, this was not an investigation that, that should have been permitted. And then once you got into court, there should have been a jury who should have seen through this ridiculous, this flimsy evidence. So it became clear to me that, you know, this was a major outrage that was going on. I didn't think I had a chance of defending a part. Visiting with people from Coleman's past. The attorneys turned investigators fanned out across Texas. They retraced Coleman's life and career, from Pecos County to Cochran County to Swisher County. Their mission was to find anything that would call Coleman's credibility into question. This was a Texas odyssey, that's for sure. We just drove south, headed down to Fort Stockton, Texas, and once we got there, we had some names and phone numbers of people that we knew were people Tom Coleman had known in the past. Pecos County was where Coleman had his first job in law enforcement. And there, investigators found signs of trouble. He was known as a person who got himself into trouble all the time. He shot out the windshield of his patrol car in Pecos County. Perhaps most importantly, we learned that Tom had made racist comments to an officer that he rode with on a training mission. Almost to a man, Coleman's former co-workers described him as a pathological liar. Also as a gun nut, people use words like freak, dangerous. Coleman told them stories about booby trapping his house when he wasn't there, uh, about this arsenal of weapons that he kept in his bathroom. In a sworn affidavit, Coleman's ex-wife said that she had seen a Ku Klux Klan card in his wallet several times. Although he denied that race had ever played a role in the Thule investigation, Coleman has acknowledged using racial slurs in the past. The word n anybody can be a n Okay, just not black people, white people, anybody. I'm not prejudiced against black people or any other origin of a person. Coleman claimed that he was forced to leave at least one job because his wife was out to get him. She sent papers up there with a restraining order or some kind of uh, paper to make me look bad. Mm -hmm. And one of my fellow officers that I work with called me and said, hey, we got papers for you. If you want them, come and get them. If you don't, um, do whatever you want. I said, okay. So I said, I ain't coming in. Swisher County Sheriff Larry Stewart claimed to know nothing about Coleman's past and said he certainly would have investigated further if he had known about it. 
I feel that we did a reasonable background on him at the time we hired him. I worked with the officers in the task force in Amarillo, and I did some interviews with some references, and I believe they did also. But the defense team came to a different conclusion. We know they did no background check in terms of calling anybody in Cochrane County that could have given them a straight answer. They claim they left a message for the sheriff that Coleman had worked for. He didn't return the call, so instead they talked to somebody, but now they don't know who it was or when they talked to them. Jeff Blackburn, Benita Gupta, and their team had worked overtime to compile a mountain of potentially damning material on Tom Coleman. But would it be enough to get their clients out of prison? The 1999 Tulia, Texas undercover drug raid had made Tom Coleman the golden boy of Texas law enforcement. But just three years later, the shine on Coleman's star was fading fast. Investigators were uncovering shocking information about his past, including a letter written by his old boss, the sheriff of Cochrane County. The sheriff put a letter in Coleman's official file with the licensing agency for law enforcement officers in Texas that said this man ought not to be in law enforcement if he's going to do people the way he did in this town. In 1997, Coleman was working as a deputy sheriff and had racked up almost $7,000 in debts to local merchants. Then one day, in the middle of his shift, Coleman simply left town. He tried to use a local television interview to make his case. When I would get something, I would pull money out of my pocket and say, no, you, everybody runs a count on all these stores here. And I said, okay, put it on the ticket. It was that way of that community. That's what they told me. You know, you know I don't have to worry about it. Save it for coffee. But the more the team dug, the more they found. It turned out that in the middle of his undercover operation in Tulia, criminal charges had been filed against Coleman in Cochrane County. He was accused of having used a Cochrane County credit card to fill his own car with gas when he worked there. He was charged with theft and arrested, but it was kept quiet. They concealed the fact of his arrest. They rigged it so there wouldn't be any records made, no mugshot. No booking photos, no booking papers, no nothing. It was a super duper secret arrest. And it seems prosecutors in the drug trials knew about Coleman's prior troubles but never told anyone. And though the criminal charges against him had been dropped after Coleman repaid his debts, his arrest record would have been vitally important for defense attorneys. We were alleging that the prosecutor in these cases had suppressed all of the evidence about Tom Coleman that he knew existed, he suppressed all of that at trial. And so no jury in Tulia ever heard anything about Tom Coleman. There is no record of Coleman ever reporting the charges against him. Word stood up, unfortunately, in different cases. He had no listening device, no camera, no partner to corroborate his accusations. We have someone from the great state of Texas here. Meanwhile, the scandals were reverberating far beyond Tulia. An international story, right? Thanks to the work of activists like Randy Credico director of the New York-based Kunstler Fund for Racial Justice. We have stood side by side with the black community. Yeah, I am compulsive. I get fixated on a cause. I continue. I'm not going to, because I can't leave it. I can't leave it until it's over. You know, particularly that case down there. The number one task of the day for us was to get this story out. To not make this some nice, quiet little thing that the power structure down here could take care of and, and uh, sweep under the rug. And it was Randy that stopped all that under the rug sweeping from going on. Working with Blackburn and the NAACP Legal Defense and Education Fund's Vanita Gupta, Credico tried to get journalists outside of Texas interested in the story. Jeff and I worked on this politically together by coming up with events together, press releases. I used his office as a base basically as a PR man in that city. And like it was an advertising firm for uh, the defendants. How are you, Jeff? Hi, Grandpa. How are you? Very well. Credico worked the media relentlessly, Hello, Huffington. talking to anyone who would listen. Uh, Court TV. One of the people who heard him was New York Times columnist Bob Herbert. I wrote five or six columns in a row initially because I was so outraged by this. And the columns got 
um, a very strong response, and the story began to get uh, picked up again. And I absolutely was not going to stop writing about it. This was not just another story. As the scandal continued to unfold, the defense team began to sense victory. None of these folks were going to let the story die. They weren't going to just turn their backs and abandon the people who were imprisoned in Texas. In early 2003, the pressure began to pay off. The Texas Attorney General began an investigation of the Tulia arrests, and the Texas Court of Criminal Appeals ordered a review of the proceedings. For the Tulia 46, it seemed for the first time that an end to their nightmare might be near. All right, I'll see you around there. Tom Coleman had always claimed that race had not played a role in his undercover investigation. Even as revelations of his misdeeds came to light, he insisted that the Tulia arrests were good. I believe we did everything right, Tulia, everything. I don't think there's not anybody in jail that don't deserve to be there. But in early 2003, the Texas Court of Criminal Appeals ruled that Freddie Brookins and three other defendants were entitled to hearings to review their convictions. This was the break the defense team had been waiting for. For the very first time in open court in Swisher County, we're going to be, have the opportunity to present all of this very significant evidence that we've been able to collect now and put it into open court on the record. Freddie Brookins began to dream about life on the outside. When I get out of here, I plan on going, hopefully, to Amarillo College. I'm going to find some school to go to. I want to go and study business and, uh, you know, do what I should have been doing a long time ago. But I have a lot of goals set. Finally, in March 2003, justice hung in the balance in Judge Ronald Chapman's courtroom. Good afternoon. As the hearing progressed, the undercover investigation was ripped to shreds. In the middle of the hearings, an unprecedented development Prosecutors recommended that the court drop charges against all 46 defendants. Judge Chapman later said, quote, Coleman's repeated instances of verifiably perjurious testimony render him entirely unbelievable under oath. End quote. The momentum for the defense continued. See the Three months later, Judge Chapman announced that he was freeing the Tulia defendants on bail, pending a final decision by the Texas Court of Criminal Appeals. The court has concluded that the ends of justice would be met by granting the bonds requested. Technically, the convictions remained on the books, and the defendants could find themselves back in jail. But for now, there was jubilation. Following a dramatic hearing at the Swisher County Courthouse today, Retired District Judge Ron Chapman granted bail and ordered the immediate release of 13 individuals who were wrongfully convicted of drug charges in Tulia, Texas. I'm overwhelmed. Oh, Out of prison and back with his family and friends, Freddie Brookins called his release a blessing. Boy, <laughs> Boy I think my arms are tired, you know, <laughs> from hugging. But I probably hugged at least about, about 100 people at least. Might have been more than that. It wasn't a total victory. Not yet. The Texas Court of Criminal Appeals had yet to weigh in. But the momentum for justice was too great. In August 2003, Texas Governor Rick Perry announced a full pardon for all of the Tulia defendants. With the stroke of his pen, they were free. And a nightmare that had begun four years earlier and a massive early morning raid was finally over. We did what the district attorney should have done before he prosecuted one damn case. We went and investigated what happened. For those who were part of the story, Tulia is only the symptom, not the disease. Lots of Americans, they've climbed onto this bandwagon of being in favor of law enforcement. They've climbed on to this campaign of hating crime and criminals. And 
by climbing onto that campaign and getting caught up in the kind of fervor that's generated by it, they've forgotten all about carefully applying the rules, hard rules that we have. The fact that innocent people were railroaded, the fact that an incompetent investigation was conducted, the fact that people were just almost in a knee-jerk way convicted and sent to prison. I don't think there's anything unique about that at all. As for the players in this drama, Tom Coleman's last job in law enforcement ended amid allegations of sexual and financial misconduct, and his testimony in Judge Chapman's courtroom earned him an indictment for aggravated perjury. Sheriff Larry Stewart is now working with activist Randy Credico and community members to foster better race relations in Tulia. Prosecutor Terry McKeacher is still in Swisher County. His fate will be determined by the voters on Election Day. In the end, it took more than three years to right the wrongs of Tulia. But to those who say our system of justice ultimately prevailed, there is a final cautionary note. This is a story about the collapse of the criminal justice system in a place called Tulia in Texas. I mean, if it wasn't for the media spotlight that was put on this story, these folks would still be rotting in prison. The defense lawyers and activists who shined a spotlight on this story have taken little comfort in their victory. The fear is that every day, in cities and towns across America, there are more cases just like this one. Collateral damage in the war on drugs. I'm James Curtis. Thanks for joining us. Coming next, a Crime Investigation Network premiere. The Wrong Man investigates the Marty Tancliffe case in which he was jailed for the murder of his parents and raises doubts about the conviction. from finding out uh, something about Coleman, which would... Spirituality is a way of accepting the fact that there is a spiritual force in the universe larger than all of mankind. But someone had to come along and invent a word called God. And someone had to say of another God and said, mine is better than yours. And someone had to create faith. Someone said, I have the true faith. Religion is the organization of spirituality into something that became the handmaiden of conquerors. Nearly all religions were brought to people and imposed on people by conquerors and used as the framework to control their mind. My main point here is that if you are the child of God and God is a part of you, then in your imagination, God's supposed to look like you. And when you accept a picture of the deity assigned to you by another people, you become the spiritual prisoners of that other people. The representation of God should always be the white, it should always be the black, because it can produce all things. The representation of God should always be the great, it should always be the black, because it can produce all things. The representation of God should always be the great, always be the black because it can produce all things. The representation of God should always be the great. It should always be the black. By definition, a slave is a person that is disarmed. For too long, 
African Americans have been on the wrong side of the gun. From the racial motivation of slavery, to the white supremacy movement, to today's escalating black on black crime. The politically correct view that a disarmed black community is a safe community is only safe for those who seek control. The black community went from being disarmed, being mistreated, being enslaved because of a lack of access to guns, ultimately went through a period of saying, aha, we have the right to bear arms, we've got to make sure it's respected, to a period where now the gun is the main tool of maintenance of the narco economy, which is the only economy in the African American community. 400 years of injustice. 400 years of being on the wrong side of the gun. It's time for change. Why is the gangbanger who has the Saturday night special in his pocket given more rights than the average everyday citizen, even though he was illegally armed, he has a right to defend himself and you have not the ability to defend yourself. So if the law says that I can't buy a certain gun, that if I can't carry a gun a certain way, I abide by that because I'm law abiding. But the criminals are the ones that carry, buy any type of guns that they want and are empowered. The basic right of every American is the right to self-defense. Take away that right and the individual is powerless. It's not unusual for America in its long history to disarm or seek to disarm undesirable populations. Gun control laws have kept African Americans in their place for hundreds of years. From the earliest days of slavery up until the mid-1800s, blatantly written gun control laws prohibited slaves and freed slaves from owning firearms. Be it further enacted that if any Negro shall presume to carry arms whatsoever, he shall be whipped with 21 lashes. With the passage of the Civil Rights Act of 1866, African Americans were given the right to bear arms. But new laws were written in such a way to exclude blacks from purchasing guns. The greatest service the authorities can render the city now is to disarm every Negro, search every Negro house, and arrest everyone who is... Inexpensive handguns were banned, or high taxes were imposed to keep guns out of the financial reach of a mostly poor black community. There's been various statues throughout every state that had sizable African-American populations after slavery to restrict through black codes the ability for blacks to be armed. In 1941, Florida Supreme Court Justice Buford declared the original 1893 Florida Gun Control Act was passed with the purpose of disarming Negro laborers. The statute was never intended to be applied to the white population. In the 1960s, when armed blacks took to the streets in the race riots in Los Angeles, Newark, and Chicago, the laws were once again rewritten. In a futile attempt to curb the violence, Congress passed the 1968 Gun Control Act. Public outcry for the restrictions of guns after the assassinations of Dr. Martin Luther King and Robert Kennedy hid the true purpose of the legislation. It was Robert Sherrill writing on the 1968 legislation who stated that it was really an attempt to restrict arms for black people. Championed by Senator Thomas Dodd and signed into law by President Johnson, the 68 Gun Control Act used shrewdly crafted language to give the authorities control to dictate who could and who could not own a firearm 
and what types of firearms Americans can own. Thomas Dodd from Connecticut, a Connecticut Yankee, goes to the Library of Congress and gets the actual gun act that the Nazis had passed in 1938, and he has it translated into English. The 68 Gun Control Act was written and in some cases almost copied word for word from the same laws the Nazis used in 1938 to control undesirable populations in Hitler's Germany. Both documents categorize and restrict firearms to certain individuals. Both documents are based on racial fear. And so they take this document and they use it to draft legislation to start requiring more licensing and more constriction of the right to keep and bear arms. When I found out what the restrictions were, I was very surprised. Each town, each police chief has the discretion of whether to give a license or not. There is just not one set rule. It seems that a lot of black people, and especially young black men, are held to a higher standard. Maybe you have a, a drunk driving record and that would be enough to disqualify you. Where legally it's not, it's not a felony conviction. Whereas maybe somebody from the suburbs that's white and maybe from a more influential family would have the same exact record as you do, but would not be denied. It's kind of subtle discrimination. It seems unthinkable today that legislation is still being written to keep minorities in their place, but it is. Purchasing a firearm requires the applicant to fill out a federal form to verify their race. Restrictive gun laws, gun bans, warrantless searches of public housing, and the confiscation of firearms in major cities continue to deprive minorities of their right to protect and defend themselves. Violence is increasing. The number of gun-related deaths is increasing yearly. So it should be rather obvious that the gun laws are not working because things are not getting better. They're making more and more laws and it's getting worse. Gun control has not worked. The federal government's own Centers for Disease Control can't show conclusive evidence that reducing guns reduces violence. Yet, these facts are dismissed. Historically, more guns in the hands of decent, law-abiding citizens has had the opposite effect. In 1964, the desegregation of Jonesboro, Louisiana High School was threatened by local authorities with fire hoses. Four armed black men arrived with loaded shotguns. Without firing a shot, the mob dispersed and the authorities retreated. The students entered the school without incident. Those men were members of the Deacons for Defense, an armed citizens militia founded in Jonesboro, Louisiana. The Deacons were everyday citizens who by 1965 had organized into more than 50 chapters throughout the South in self-defense from the Ku Klux Klan. In 1964, down in Louisiana, there were all types of demonstrations going on by Freedom Riders. Many times, the demonstrations would be met by armed white resistance. People were dying and being shot and intimidated because they were unarmed. And basically, because they were unarmed, they were also being denied the right to vote. The Deacons protected civil rights workers for CORE, the Congress of Racial Equality, who were registering voters in Louisiana and Mississippi. They patrolled black neighborhoods and protected black churches where CORE was holding voting rights seminars. These were regular, everyday people. They were not some paramilitary group. The thing that made them different is they were veterans from the Korean War. They were veterans from World War II. And so they did have the training and they did have the discipline that came from being veterans. Once the Klansmen and the white citizen counselor and the deputy sheriff that was wearing the sheet at night learned that these deacons for defense would shoot back, then they were not as readily willing to go and pounce upon them in the wee hours of the morning. 
because now they knew that, well, the right to bear arms is providing constitutional rights for these blacks, irrespective of the fact that we want to take away their civil rights. They're fighting on solid ground. The effectiveness of the deacons in deterring violence was so great that Dr. Martin Luther King and Floyd McKissick of CORE hired the deacons to protect the marchers from Klan aggression in the 1966 March Against Fear. The very effect of armed resistance in the name of civil rights is what really cast a new enthusiasm into the civil rights movement at a critical time. When the right to bear arms is put in the proper perspective historically, then people will see that the African American community having guns to protect themselves, not from crooked cops and police brutality, but from the culture of drugs and gangs because of a war going on due to the narco economy. And so until we address why are these people armed, why are they shooting, we're not going to be able to create an oasis of redevelopment in the inner cities of America. Inner city violence is directly related to the black market for illegal drugs, gangs, and drug dealers' turf wars. Today's war on drugs, like alcohol prohibition in the 1920s, share many similarities. Back then, gangsters and bootleggers took to the streets to protect their territories. Homicide rates skyrocketed at the beginning of prohibition, then took a huge drop after its repeal. Homicide rates again spiked in the early 1970s when President Nixon declared America's war on drugs. More than 35 years later, Homicide rates in America's inner cities fluctuate, but continue to peak. We've got to stop the demonization of guns. We've got to encourage law-abiding citizens to arm themselves. And then we have to circulate that information throughout the high crime areas. Government published facts speak volumes on the effectiveness of armed citizens. According to the U.S. Bureau of Justice Statistics, 57% of polled felons agree criminals are more worried about meeting an armed victim than they are about running into the police. And, according to the U.S. Department of Justice, the probability of serious injury to women during an attack is two and a half times greater when they are unarmed. If women were able to freely carry firearms, there would be less chance of, of somebody looking at them as a victim. There would be less crime committed against women because a criminal would, would have to question, is this woman armed? And, according to the Bureau of Justice Statistics, 550 rapes and 1,100 murders are prevented every day just by showing a gun. We've got to tell the other side of the story about the hundreds of thousands of times in America where guns are used to stop violence and to stop a crime from being committed. The police aren't there to protect us. They are there to enforce laws and to arrest criminals once they are criminals, once they have committed a crime. But they're not our personal bodyguards, so I have to do that for myself. No matter how many gun control laws they put into effect, no matter how much they try to restrict it, even if they make it illegal for anybody to own guns, there's going to be a black market. The community does not get safer when the criminals are told there's no guns available on the part of law-abiding citizens. People are going to have access to firearms, and the ones that are going to have them are going to be the criminals. That's like an open season for crime. It's just like drugs are illegal, and it's a booming business. History has a habit of repeating itself. Now, as it was back then, politicians and community leaders wrongly claim less guns means less violence. Now, as it was back then, politicians and community leaders wrongly misguide the public in believing that the police and not the community 
can best provide protection. Even though the Supreme Court has publicly stated that state and local governments do not have an obligation to protect citizens from criminal harm. Guns are a convenient target that disingenuous civil rights leaders and politicians hide behind because they don't want to address the real problem, which is why are all the black youth dropping out of high school and getting guns. Gun control advocate Sarah Brady, wife of James Brady, whose name is on the 1993 Brady Bill Violence Protection Act, purchased her own son a high-powered rifle. I think they're misguided and I think it's just, it's a hot issue. We can always get a bunch of politicians, well here's the mayor, here's the alderman, here's the state rep, here's the state, well here's the president of the Senate. Here's, they'll always come out to a press conference where they can put on a shirt and a tie and insinuate that they're there to protect the children. It resonates with voters, it's something that's unquestionable in terms of its merit, and it's something that's patently wrong in terms of the gun control issue because gun control does not protect the children. Fact is, a child up to the age of 14 is four times more likely to drown, four times more likely to die in a fire, and 13 times more likely to die in an auto collision than from a firearm accident. And that's a message that has to be driven home. What we've got to do is create a solidarity for gun owners that are across the political spectrum, across the racial spectrum. I think that it's high time that blacks, whites, all Americans of goodwill realize that the sacred right to self-defense is at risk in America during the next four years in an Obama administration with Eric Holder going in as Attorney General. Why? Not because they're bad people, but because their philosophy is such that drying up the availability of guns will create greater safety. So I think that what we're looking for is not to be found with gun control, but can only be found when citizens take it upon themselves to protect themselves and their property. For too long, community leaders, ministers, and politicians have failed to reject the gun control lies. For too long, African Americans have lost control of our neighborhoods. For too long, African Americans have been denied the right to keep and bear arms. For too long, African Americans have been victims of criminals, drug dealers, and dangerous gun control policy. For too long, African Americans have been on the wrong side of the gun. We have to remain vigilant. We have to challenge the Congress when they try to bring about these new gun control laws. And we have to educate the African American community and other communities in America, the racist roots of what gun control is really all about. <laughs>